When interviewed on the day of the census, Marguerite Palmer, Honorary Secretary of the uh, IWFL, told the Irish Times that, quote, she could not divulge any of their plans, but their scheme was entirely different to that employed in England. Instead, she said, Irish suffragists intended to be conspicuous by their absence. So what happened on the 2nd of April? Uh, the first point to note is that uh, there were no public gatherings or protests in Ireland. It is not clear why the Irish census evaders decided against public demonstration. Uh, the most likely reason is that they would not have been able to muster large numbers. As pointed out already, Irish suffragism was in a period of transition. Suffragist militancy in the country was as yet in its infancy, and the cohort of militant activists was small. Secondly, the organisers of the protest almost certainly hoped that a less demonstrative approach would facilitate the participation of moderates in census evasion. Indeed, a suffragette correspondent to the Freeman's Journal wrote that several of our friends have recently congratulated us on the constitutional and eminently ladylike nature of census resistance. Uh, in fact, it is on that very account being very widely adopted in Ireland. Further, getting about in town at night without male chaperones was not considered ladylike. And in any case, Dublin in 1911 did not offer the range of public spaces that London suffragists had available to them, especially at night. In his letters of some, of some days earlier, Archibim had argued that silent evasion of the census was a pointlessly narrow form of protest, as it cannot be, be a very successful method of advertisement since, though militant, it is quite unostentatious and incapable of proper estimation of its effects. The publication of Archibim's own letter undermined this argument somewhat, as did the considerable press coverage that the protest received. Archibim was correct to this extent, however. It is extremely difficult, even now, to assess the extent of the boycott because, as David Wilson suggested yesterday, it is very difficult to analyse an absence. Nonetheless, a trawl of the digitised census records for Dublin does reveal certain, certain patterns. At the most fundamental level, a boycott did take place, as a number of Dublin suffragists do not appear to have made returns. There is no return, for instance, for a Marguerite or Margaret Palmer matching the known biographical detail of the Honorary Secretary of the Irish Women's Franchise League. Neither do returns exist that match the details of the suffragists Marjorie Hasler and Kathleen Houston, both Hasler and Houston were Dublin-based and were sentenced to prison for militant activity in Dublin in the summer of 1912. It is a reasonable assumption that these women successfully and deliberately evaded the census, although it, be, it may never be possible to prove this absolutely. <clears throat> when digitised records for the rest of Ireland are available, it will be possible to rule out their being away in the country for the weekend, but even then the possibility that they were abroad will continue to exist. Uh, the digitised census do reveal... Um, firm evidence uh, of the attempts of several women to evade the census. One of these is Mary F. Earle. Uh, this is her census return. I hope you can uh, see some of it at least. Uh, whose letter to the Irish Times we saw earlier. At first glance, Mary Earle appears to have made a return. Here you can see it at her address at 39 Raglan Road, which she gave in her letter to the, the address which she gave in her letter to the Irish Times. She is the head of household. She's 40. Um, she has uh, two sons and a servant living with her. However, if we look a little more closely, we can see that Mary Earle did not complete this form, but it was filled out by MB, or Michael Barry, uh, the census enumerator for this area, and we can see Barry's note uh, filled as a result of inquiries made by the enumerator, Mrs. Earle having refused to give any information. Um, and you can see, um, if I click on again, the fact that Mrs. Earle did not make the return is further confirmed uh, by the fact uh, that she... The, section over here for the signature of the head of household is blank. Okay. Um, the enumerators of the census of Ireland had extensive powers to make inquiries about those who did not comply with their obligations under the census. Their ability to wield those powers was enhanced because, unlike in the rest of the United Kingdom, the enumerators in Ireland were policemen. In the case of Dublin, they were members of the Dublin Metropolitan, Metropolitan Police. It was the head of household who was primarily responsible for, the fill for filling the form. And in not making the returns, women such as Mary Earle, who was a head of household, invited prosecution. A boycotting woman who was not the head of household placed the relevant uh, relative in danger of prosecution. In an effort to avoid this second eventuality, it seems that the leadership of, of the IWFL gathered um, at least some boycotters in small groups in houses which for various reasons were not enumerated. Um, this tactic was also adopted in Britain, and this is a photograph from Britain. You can see the no vote, no census sign up in the house and all the women gathered together asleep on the night of the census. 
Um, in the memoir of James and Margaret Cousins, written in 1950, James recalled that on census night, Margaret and Lizzie Duffy, their domestic servant, left to stay at a nearby house that had been vacant for some time and therefore not on the enumeration list. James remembered that he was suffering from scarlatina fever at the time, so he was left at home in bed with a form, a pen, an envelope, and some disinfectant. <laughs> he wrote, When the official hour came, I wrote on the declaration form a note to the effect that I could not give a true enumeration of my household as its female members were absent in protest against being officially classed with children, criminals, lunatics, and such like. I added that I had filled the paper while laid up in Scarlatina, but had duly disinfected it and the envelope. Uh, this is the form that James Cousins filled in for 35 Strand Road. And you can see his actions had acquired some colour with time and telling. Um, there is no sign of the explanatory note and health report that he remembered so vividly in his memoir. Not only that, but you can see that despite his claims to the contrary, James Cousins uh, filled in Lizzie Duffy, the servant's uh, details, into the form. This raises the interesting issue of class and female suffrage. In 1911, the Irish suffragist groups did not demand universal female suffrage, but were willing to accept a limited female franchise linked to property. Despite his claims in 1950 and 1911, James Cousins saw no reason not to enumerate his female servant. Of course, it is possible that Lizzie Duffy wanted to be enumerated. Um, in any case, the DMP enumerator Patrick O'Connell amended the form by crossing uh, out Lizzie Duffy, writing in the detail of Margaret Cousins. Uh, she's there as Gertrude. She was sometimes called Gr Greta Gertrude Cousins. Um, and then copying out the details provided on Lizzie Do Duffy on what's, in what society regarded as her proper place at the bottom of the list, before finally noting um, Mrs. Cousins, who is a suffragette, enumerated from inquiries made. You can see at the bottom of the form again. Here. Um, Hannah Sheehy Skeffington was absent from her home at 11, 11 Grosvenor Place with the purpose of evading the census. In later years, she claimed to have spent the night in Wicklow in a cottage given to her and some other boycotters by Countess Markovich. She recalled with amusement that we led the police a dance camping on the hills or in empty houses scattered far and wide. 